So um, I, I wanted to organise this talk, um, I mean partly because I was biased and when I was a first year swimmer, I really loved swimming history <laughs> and I wanted to talk about why, why it's important. I think it divides a lot of students who I think it's really important and it's the best thing on the course or you think it's pointless and you kind of hate it. Um, but in the recent financial crisis it has come up that studying economic history is important, it's important for predicting crises, for predicting um, credit cycles, uh, and it gives us um, a level of insight that we might not get from purely empirical studies. So uh, I want to introduce you to Professor Nicholas Graf. He's a professor of uh, economics and economic history at the University of Warwick. I imagine if you've studied first year economics, you probably know who he is. Um, he comes up quite a lot. <laughs> um, his research interests are the Industrial Revolution, uh, British Economic Decline, and Analysis of Growth Rates. So please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Emily. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me back to Cambridge. Some of you will know that I was a student here, and I always uh, enjoy coming back, so any excuse. I think it's only two years since I last spoke to this society, but that's probably long enough for everybody to have forgotten, so I got asked again. Okay. Right. I set myself this question, economic history for economists, why? Uh, I'm not entirely going to proselytise. I think it's an open question whether you think it's a good idea or not. But I will put a kind of pro case and then um, uh, you can shoot it down uh, when we get to question time. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few general points to start with and then I'm going to try and illustrate them with little bits of economic history. Uh, I'm going to emphasise probably mostly in that uh, thinking about crises and in particular the Great Depression. Uh, where I think economic history does offer you a somewhat different vantage point from what you'd get from just studying, uh, say, macroeconomics. Okay, so let me start by saying I think the past does have a lot of useful economics. By that, uh, what I mean is um, that I if you think back through history, basically you've got a much wider range of experience to look at. You've got fast growth, you've got slow growth, uh, you've got periods of inflation, you've got periods of price falls, you've got periods where unemployment seemed intractable, periods where it seemed no problem at all, and so on. We can see a very wide range of policy settings, which some of which we don't see in the present day. Go back to the 19th century and we see the balanced budget and the gold standard, for example. Since from time to time people advocate returning to those policies, it might be as well to know something about them. And institutional settings, well, again, a wide range of different ways of running the economy, different rules of the game. Uh, differences, for example, with regard to the central bank. Is it dependent or independent? Uh, differences with regard to uh, the extent to which we see the rule of law being enforced and in what ways. Uh, differences in uh, the way that capital markets are organised. All those sorts of things uh, add to the range of experience. As Emily said right at the start, one very obvious point is there have been a lot of financial crises in economic history. And because, like anybody else, historians like bad news, uh, there tends to be quite a lot of writing about those financial crises. You really couldn't study a serious course in economic history without realising that financial crises have been in the past uh, pretty important, pretty devastating. And again, it's quite interesting to think about the, the causes and the consequences. Uh, on a practical basis, if you want a long time series for uh, something you, you're keen to examine its properties as an econometrician, uh, economic history is almost by necessity something that you're going to consult. If you do consult those long time series, it's pretty important to understand uh, the foibles, the limitations, the basis on which they were constructed. Otherwise, you might end up estimating an assumption, uh, which might not be the cleverest thing uh, ever to do. You've re just rediscovered how the series was created, uh, in other words. Natural experiments, that's something which econometricians have got ever more excited by. Again, history is the place where we might look for some of those. One of the most interesting natural experiments, which I think has given rise to some really good work, for example, was the division of Germany after World War II. 
The division of Germany had some quite important economic consequences. Because the division of Germany was not essentially predicted beforehand, we can think of it as an exogenous shock. And that has some important properties. And then I think the last thing that I would really, really stress, and probably more than anything else almost, is that if you study history, then I think you're studying a story about constraints. Policy makers in a given period do not inherit a clean sheet. Uh, they come with, his, uh, the economy comes with historical baggage. There are things that are off limits at particular times, or things which uh, it, it's seen as, uh, to say the least, politically risky to challenge. That's one of the ways in which history matters, in the sense that uh, what has gone before constrains the options that you now have, and maybe constrains them really quite considerably. So, why might I advocate thinking about economic history? I think I'd probably want to say it's quite important to think of it as in some ways distinctive. It's not, I think, just another branch of applied economics, although clearly it can be treated as applied economics or analysed with the tools of applied economics. There's nothing wrong in that. I think probably the most important claim that you find economic historians making is that the world is at least sometimes and in some respects path dependent. That's a slightly more extreme version, if you like, of history matters. Certainly if path dependency is such as to lock you in completely to no choice whatsoever, which is a, a kind of extreme story. Who was perhaps one of the biggest advocates of path dependence in economic history? Well, I think it's Douglas North, who, as you probably know, died last week. And his branch of path dependence revolves around the importance of institutions for historical outcomes, the difficulties of changing institutions, and the extent to which societies get locked in to not changing institutions. The switching costs are always just too high. I think the third bullet's quite important, and especially when you start uh, thinking perhaps about after you've studied economics at Cambridge and you're getting a job. You might want to say economic analysts have to con uh, convince or persuade people who are not really economists uh, when you get uh, out into the city or wherever it's going to be. Why does convincing historians make it more interesting, more difficult? because historians like different sorts of evidence. They're unlikely to be persuaded by a regression on its own. Uh, they would uh, essentially ask you, does this uh, pass the common sense test, as well as satisfying uh, an economist's prior? I think that's quite an important challenge sometimes to meet, to think you've got to convince them. What does that in particular mean I think it means you have to consult a wider range of evidence than economists left to their own devices uh, will look at. Let me take a very simple example which some of you probably come across. The claim that in the interwar period in Britain unemployment was search unemployment, it was voluntary unemployment very largely, the claim made by Benjamin and Cochin at the end of the 1970s. I think an economic historian trying to convince historians of that claim would in fact have a very hard time because it would keep running up against the evidence which was submitted to royal commissions, the surveys of the time, what we know about the behaviour of the unemployed. Inferring this from a regression, which is not, as it turned out, a very satisfactory inference because it's bedeviled by observational equivalence, uh, there are several other ways of interpreting their results, uh, that would be a, a neat example. And lastly, I've always thought that economic historians, although they use the tools of neoclassical economics, one hopes sometimes quite sensitively, are not typically implicit, fully paid up, total believers that neoclassical economics uh, includes the sort of full story of the world. So I think economic history is actually an antidote to taking much too literally, much too far, the insights of a, of a neoclassical uh, modelling strategy.
This is more for historians, but I would want to argue that economics can improve historical understanding. So I, I see the story as one of synergy, symbiosis between uh, economics and history. Uh, what do economics, econometrics, what does the understanding of that do to help historians? Apart from anything else, I think it makes the facts better. Think of my own work on the Industrial Revolution. That's entirely about how to construct index numbers properly. But if you don't understand how to construct index numbers properly, you'll get the story seriously wrong. Uh, that's pretty important in particular, in general, in measuring economic growth well and in measuring the sources of economic growth well. I won't dwell on that now. We could come back to it in questions if you want. Better analysis of data? Well, I think that's to do with things like getting the econometrics approximately right. It's, for example, at the simplest level, distinguishing clearly between correlation and causation, thinking about identification strategies, whatever it might be. New hypotheses? Well, again, let's go back to that unemployment one. Uh, the value of Benjamin coaching was they did introduce a new hypothesis to what was then the literature, namely that if you change the uh, nature of uh, unemployment benefits or unemployment insurance, behaviour will probably react to that. Uh, the standard historian's view of the interwar period at that point was a kind of unreconstructed vulgar Keynesianism, uh, which rather ignored that kind of view of the world altogether. You can think of lots and lots of uh, examples of those new hypotheses. If you put those things together, in particular, because I think when you put forward the hypotheses, it makes you think quite hard about the caterist paribus conditions of what you're trying to infer, then one hopes you end up with more robust results. Major advances have clearly been achieved with regard to the Industrial Revolution. That goes absolutely without saying. While I'm here, you can say something different when I'm gone, but not now. We have a completely different view of uh, the role that economic policy did and could have played in the 1930s compared with uh, only 30 years ago, I think it would be fair to say. We know lots more about the pre-industrial economy in terms of, I think, having quite a good understanding of various aspects of what a Malthusian economy is really like, or a late Malthusian economy. And I, compared with when I was a student, I think it's also fair to say that economics has a massively improved menu for studying uh, economic history. Let's just take Asimoglu as an example. Part of the Asimoglu story is a whole range of interesting hypotheses uh, about the role of institutions. But think also of Asimoglu on directed technical change, which is a major part of the way economic historians have always thought about the world, but not been good at formalising until these later models came along. This is, in a sense, both of those examples are really to do with endogenous innovation views of the world. But, you know, since I was a student, new industrial economics, new international economics, this requires a massive rewriting of economic history. Uh, we can also, uh, I think, think that uh, we nowadays think automatically almost about worlds where information is asymmetric and imperfect. That, again, changes the way you think about the past. Now, economists, I've just bigged them up. But I think economists lack various things which a good course in economic history wakes you up to. Historians have skills which economists either don't have or have less of, or are sometimes um, sort of uh, dimly aware of, if you like. There are historical methods that complement, and in some cases are essential, for using economic techniques, certainly for the investigation of the past, but arguably also for looking at the present. The first one of those would go under the general historian's label, interrogating sources. When you consult a primary source, a government document, let's say, you need surely to ask, why was this written? Who wrote it? What are the likely biases in it? Uh, is it really telling me the truth? Or is it spin, in some sense? I guess uh, you undergraduates are probably more cynical now than we were 50 years ago. Uh, you live in a world of much more spin, I dare say. But it's always very important to ask of any source, can we believe this? 
What are the likely biases in it? And I think that applies to present day materials issued by all sorts of people as well as the past. It's a good discipline to have whenever you think about or quote a source. Secondly, again, you may not need me to tell you this, but I don't, uh, don't suppose you doubt me now that it's quite good to have healthy scepticism about data. Uh, I think you only have to see the chief economist of the ONS, an old friend of mine, the hapless Joe Grice, uh, appearing every three months or so to say, yeah, we revised our estimate again. Uh, we've re-revised our re-revised estimate. Now, some of that is to do with the shambles in which the ONS finds itself at the moment, some of which is trying to do things too quickly. Some of it is because in, with the best will in the world, uh, data will change and you get a more complete picture. But again, scepticism about data, how was this data put together, for what purpose, what are its likely biases, those are questions you should always be thinking to ask. The historian, as I said earlier, tends to look for more than just economics of the conventional narrow kind, looking for corroborative evidence. And these historians are certainly well aware of the rhetoric, uh, the importance of being per uh, persuasive to a wide audience. And that's particularly true if later on in your life you want to influence policy. Perfectly fair also to say that economic history can be misused, often is misused, uh, and some of the, the things that you see historical material brought forward to do are surely wrong. So a lot of evidence in history requires inference. It requires measurement. Uh, it can't be directly observed. It can only be constructed perhaps through a statistical technique. Take, for example, the notion of the fiscal multiplier. We can't observe the fiscal multiplier. We can try in various ways to try to estimate it. When we go back and ask ourselves what was the multiplier at some particular point in the past, we quite often find either that the data don't exist to estimate it as a modern economist might like, or that the data do but they've not yet been used. And there are a bunch of sort of old estimates relying on out-of-date techniques or whatever. So quite often you find the evidence set is less complete than you would like. I've in effect said some of the facts are not reliable. I'll come back to that in a moment. Misleading lessons. History is all about contingency. Uh, history is uh, all about relationships which operate or work well at a point in time, but are not necessarily generalizable. Think of this. An economist arriving from Mars and being shown a bit of data on the interwar period would surely have predicted the collapse of the Eurozone at least four years ago and would have inferred that from what happened to the gold standard. The gold standard lesson clearly doesn't carry over the reasons for the collapse of that system. But you do need to think quite hard why, and you do need to be a bit cautious about inferring lessons which, as I say, are perhaps rather contingent. And then I think we do have to recognize there is a lot of partisan history sitting out there. History is usually written, or a lot of it at least, is written by people who have a point to make. And that includes economists. So you always do have to ask where they're coming from. But you also, I think, have to ask, have their priors limited their search for evidence, limited their interpretation of the evidence, uh, delivered a particular story, which is not the only way to interpret the history uh, they're looking at. Uh, think of the controversy over whether late Victorian Britain failed, and that would give you a very good uh, set of those kinds of examples. Okay, I said I'd just have some general points. Now let me just try a few historical bits and pieces to illustrate one or two of those points. Let me start with the Bengal famine, which some of you may know about. Uh, occurred in 1943, 1943-4, uh, in wartime British India. A lot of people died. Made very famous among, amongst other uh, people looking at it by Amartya Sen, uh, whose big book on poverty and famines uh, you relied on this example particularly, it's a classic example, of what Sen called the entitlement's view of famine. That it's not about absolute food shortage, 
It's about who has the command of the resources to be able to uh, purchase food. It's a distributional view, if you like, rather than a kind of Malthusian view. Sen's interpretation of the Bengal famine uh, is that it was primarily the result of speculation and hoarding. That's essentially an entitlements view, if you wish, and not due to a serious decline in food availability. Uh, the main evidence, I think, which Sen relied on, or certainly an important part, was the report of the Famine Inquiry Commission. That was a British government commission which reported in 1945 about the inquiry and had a remarkably similar view. An economic historian approaches the same problem. Will that historian get the same result? Not necessarily. Cormac O'Grada revisited this. He's done an awful lot of work on famines, as some of you may know. And he did a very nice tawny lecture for the Economic History Society uh, in 2007, in which he looked at this experience again. I think actually the paper may have appeared in 2008, if you're wanting to chase it up in the Economic History Review. So O'Grada did the natural stuff that a historian would. He asked, what did this government report want people to believe and why? He looked at all the evidence presented to the Commission, including the stuff which is not covered in the report. In other words, he went back to all the primary sources. He looked at what happened during the famine, in particular in the, at the time when the government tried to <coughs> reveal and uh, get um, uh, disbanded, if you like, hidden hordes. He then linked that to an economist's analysis of what the difference is between uh, food availability deficiency hypothesis, a fad hypothesis, and an entitlements one. He notes the real difference is what happens to the producers. Producers do badly if it's a fad story, because basically they've just seen a massive inward shift of the production function. That's going to hit their rents, it's going to hit their returns, and in an entitlements view of the world, it's the consumers or a subset of them who get hit very hard. And lastly, I think to be fair to O'Grada, he didn't have a strong view before the outset as to what he would find. I think that was helpful to him. Okay, what did O'Grada turn up when he did all that work? Well, he firstly showed that the British government had a massively strong motive to cover up that there was a food deficiency famine at the time and subsequently. It didn't want to be caught out subsequently that it had been lying. It had been lying in 1943 because it was unwilling to provide the food supplies from outside Bengal because the shipping was being prioritised for other wartime purposes, putting it rather simply. It's a bit more subtle than that, but that's the story. O'Grada also has a view about complicit Indian politicians who, for various reasons of their own, wanted to play along with that. Secondly, he shows that actually there was no evidence that hordes could be found, even though government tried very hard to get them released into the market in July 1943. He looks through all the survey evidence of the period. It's very clear that producers, in particular landholders, were distressed. Many of them were able to, unable to produce enough to keep their land. The conclusion, Sen's interpretation, is not really persuasive. There is a food availability problem here, and quite a serious one. I'm just suggesting, if you think about what I've just gone through, that epitomises using the historical skills, together with the economic analysis, and not accepting the primary source at face value. That's a really important set of lessons to, uh, to appreciate. Okay, I said economic historians probably uh, are not terribly persuaded by some bits of neoclassical economics. Let's take the most fundamental bit of that, and again, the different way in which economic historians think about how things evolve. Divergence big time, I think we know about in a sense, is the widening income gaps across the world that characterize the era of modern economic growth after about the mid-19th century. Uh, you can certainly say in this period that institutional policy failures matter, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But I think another thing which uh, I think a view of the data would tell you is there's a very strong spatial correlation of development outcomes, which is something which uh, nowhere, as far as I know, in neoclassical economics is there a model which will give you that result. In other words, pick any country in sub-Saharan Africa and it's going to be fairly poor. 
pick any country in Western Europe, it's going to be pretty rich. You know, th those sorts of things uh, are pretty clear, if you like. It's very definitely, when you look at the data and when you analyze it, do the econometrics on it, it's not a neoclassical world of rapid beta and sigma convergence. Remember, beta convergence is if you're behind, you grow faster as you catch up. Sigma convergence is basically that the variation of incomes, uh, variance of incomes around the world tends to zero over time. Incomes per person, I should say. Uh, it's clearly not. The data, you don't only need to look at the data to see that, but then why not? Neoclassical economics has at best a rather shaky answer to that, I think. Uh, those are some numbers from the Madison Project, Purchasing Power Parity Adjusted, um, done in 1990, Geary Karmis dollars, the standard Madison uh, numbers. Um, look at China and India, at least through 1973, compare them with yes, West Europe. China and India do start to catch up. Africa gets left behind. The gaps in 2010 are much bigger than they were in 1870, the ratios of those numbers. So this is a world which is a combination of divergence, delayed catching up, but it's certainly not a smooth beta sigma convergence of the kind that a neoclassical model would predict. Uh, you could do it a different way and look at shares of world GDP measured in the same sort of numbers, these Geary Karmis dollars. China has a third of world GDP in 1820, 5% in 1973. And it's started to catch up and may get back to its uh, sort of early 19th century share, um, well, probably not in my lifetime, but possibly in your lifetime, let's put it like that. Okay, and you can see the, the converse things happening to Western Europe and the United States in the 19th century. Robert Lucas uh, said uh, in a quite well-known paper in 2000 that that was an aberration. In the 21st century, normal service would be resumed. The divergence would be superseded by convergence, if you wish, and this inter-society income inequality would start to uh, die away. What was Lucas's argument? Well, I'm not, I may be doing him a slight injustice, but I think this will more or less summarize it. Uh, obstacles to growth had been removed by the start of the 21st century in the sense that historical experience by now gave you a blueprint. What sort of policies would work? What sort of institutions would be conducive to economic growth? You could work it out from the successes and failures of the previous century. In 1900, you might have believed that a Soviet-style growth program would work. Uh, when I was a student, I read a textbook written by a very famous economist which told me that the Soviet Union would overtake the United States by the year 2000. Uh, yet another of those economist predictions that didn't quite work. Um, Lucas, I think, argued that globalization was good for catch-up, more, more, more mobile capital. Uh, if you got it right, you could borrow other people's savings uh, rather than have to rely on your own. The speed of catch-up growth would increase markedly. Uh, capital to labor and total factor, factor productivity gaps would be rapidly reduced, said Lucas. Okay, so it would be back to beta and ultimately sigma convergence, just after a little delay while people got things wrong in the 20th century. Well, I think economic historians and at least quite a few economists are a bit less sanguine than that. Let me suggest a few reasons why you might be, based on the large volume of historical evidence sitting out there about the process of economic growth across the world. The Lucas' story, in a sense, invokes the solo model of neoclassical growth. It basically relies on the proposition that total factor productivity levels will be the same all the way across the world. Everybody has access to the same technology and can achieve the same level of efficiency. I think that's a very strong and implausible assumption. And I think history would tend to press us to that view that it is implausible. When people have looked at TFP levels in the late 20th or early 21st century, they invariably find that they're hugely different, however you try uh, to measure them. Uh, I'll skip the second bullet. The third one, though, I think economic historians would stress that geography has effects on economic outcomes, institutions do, and so do policies. But policies don't automatically get changed to follow a blueprint, uh, nor do institutions. 
On the contrary, interest groups, political constraints, those sorts of things imply that they differ persistently. And so economic historians, unlike Lucas, would, I think, see this convergence process as undermined by something which Doug North would have called path dependence, or at least that the footprint of history uh, sits quite uh, heavily there. And so I think we, as economic historians, are much less optimistic than neoclassical economists about convergence. Examples of path dependence, technological historians think of technological lock-in, the most famous alleged example some of you are using as we speak, QWERTY, the keyboard, uh, the layout of the keyboard still as it was in the 1880s when typewriters were invented. The new institutional economic history tradition, that's Douglas North, institutions which develop their own interest groups and network externalities which are too strong to allow reform in some cases. New economic geography, which I think gives economic resonance to old stories about core and periphery, persistent advantages of the core over the periphery based on uh, larger markets, better agglomerations, and so on. Those are things which are not in the simple neoclassical playbook, but a study of economic history, I think, uh, makes it quite hard to ignore them. Uh, you realise much more than if you've never looked at this stuff that when you use a neoclassical model, you are, to some extent, suspending your disbelief. You're using it for a purpose, that's fine, as long as you recognise its limitations as well as its strengths. I'll finish with a few minutes on the Great Depression, uh, if I may. Partly because I think this is almost the best example of why maybe the economist in the, in the classroom in the first year or maybe the second year of their undergraduate career might feel that exposure to economic history gave them something they won't get elsewhere. Great Depression of the 1930s was a massive event. It's traumatic. It'd be much better, actually, if every school child studied this rather than the great dictators. The great collapse of the world economy would be a much better module, it seems to me, but it's not quite as sexy as Hitler and Stalin. I, I appreciate that. Well, maybe sexy is the wrong word, but you know what I mean. Somehow it doesn't quite have the same sort of appeal. I think it could be made to have the same appeal. You just need some imaginative videos of uh, sort of people being ruined and, or, yeah, anyway, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Jumping off skyscrapers, that sort of thing, uh, if you want the sort of video game approach to it. Okay, now, Great Depression in the 1930s, I think actually any economic student should have a bit of an introduction to this, simply because it really does epitomise this much wider range of experience. Things that we've on the whole not seen since, certainly not in the same way, and which give us important things to think about and to analyse. So the Great Depression includes really strong price falls, at least in the worst affected countries. That's what I mean by deflation, I mean price deflation. Uh, very large increases in unemployment and decreases in real GDP in the most affected countries. Complete collapse of the international monetary system of the late 1920s. The most important for set of financial crises in Western economic history. Uh, eclipsing even what we've been through in the last few years. I've signalled that by bank failures. And, until recently, Almost the only well-analyzed experience we've had of an economy at the zero lower bound, of economies where interest rates, nominal interest rates, are as low as they can go, but maybe real interest rates are very high because prices are falling. Yet, when you talk to people, you know, you have a drink with somebody or you talk to somebody on the bus or whatever, they find out you're an economic historian, they want to know about the Great Depression, they'll always come out with this bunch of myths. And I fear that a lot of economists also believe them. The Wall Street crash caused the American Great Depression. I don't think so. We can come back to that. No serious economic historian would give any credence to that whatsoever. Roosevelt's deal, New Deal was a big fiscal <coughs> stimulus. Only if you think a stimulus amounting to about 2% of GDP in an economy with um, a, a demand gap, which is probably 25% of GDP, uh, only if you think that's big. I don't think so. Uh, so. Again, that's been known in the professional literature for at least 60 years since people first did the sums. A technology shock caused the American Great Depression. 
only in the imagination of some amazing ivory tower economists somewhere stuck in the Midwest of the United States. It is inconceivable that you can tell me a sensible argument for a technological shock to create this a big downturn. And the people who tried to test the idea have unanimously concluded this hypothesis does not work. World War II saved the United States from secular stagnation. This newly fashionable again idea put forward by Summers. In the 1930s it was Alvin Hansen. Oh no, I don't think it did. What the United States had throughout the 1930s and even the 1920s was a very strong rate of technological progress. It was a very strong trend rate of growth which uh, was inherited from uh, the technological prowess of the early decades of the 20th century which drove the United States through the one big wave. Uh, so World War II might have helped the labour market by dealing with hysteresis problems but it isn't the solution to secular stagnation. I like numbers as you probably know if you had to read my book. There are some numbers on the USA. This is a serious depression. Look how far, these are index numbers uh, for real GDP and the GDP deflator. Big fall in GDP, big fall in prices, strong recovery in the later 1930s, big unemployment shock. If we have a banking crisis, we'd better analyze it. All the analysis we've got says bank failures made a massive difference to the American economy, and bank failures were not ruled out by an efficient markets hypothesis, neither then nor later. The bank failures weren't random. They reflected a world of moral hazard, a world of asymmetric information, a world in some cases of weak regulation. You can partly infer that because states in the US differed in their regulation. You can see what difference regulation makes. Uh, we know from the work of Ben Bernanke and a whole host of people who followed him with lots of detailed micro studies that when banks failed, financial intermediation services were reduced and there is a big effect on GDP. Uh, this causes a credit crunch, a drying up of investment. There's virtually no investment by 1933 and so on. Lastly, from a quasi-natural experiment amongst other things, different bits of the Fed behave differently. We know that a seriously aggressive lender of last resort could have made a lot of difference, could have prevented many of the bank failures. There are a series of really important policy lessons there which you cannot get out of studying the economy of sort of 1985 to 2007. What ended the Great Depression? Well, my story would be its regime change. It's not to do with uh, fiscal stimulus in the normal Keynesian sense. It's to do with a change in inflationary expectations and falling real interest rates. Uh, the New Deal, I've already said, essentially it didn't raise aggregate demand, but it probably might have had a big effect on inflationary expectations. Here, I think, is an example of the old literature until about 10 years ago would have taken you through something close to an ISLM view of the world and would have looked to calculate the change in the government's fiscal position and have some idea about what the multiplier might have been. More modern approach says you need to think about a depressed economy with interest rates at the lower bound and an imperative need to get real interest rates down. That creates a quite different way of thinking about uh, what happened during the New Deal. So the better, e or the more interesting for me at least, economics gives you a new handle on the experience. You don't want the really old stuff. But equally, this range of experience is giving you something to use these ideas on, to explore them, to see if they work. And uh, Eggertson is the man who did that. Inflationary expectations, uh, there's some sort of textual analysis which says actually when you look at other sources, you don't just look at the economic model, you can find the same thing. Once the United States leaves the gold standard, everybody starts talking about inflation. You, know, you can capture that through a computerized textual analysis, show it's a, a big statistical effect and so on. I've already, I think, uh, told you why Alvin Hansen was wrong, uh, so I can skip over that one. Uh, there are some numbers just to show that I didn't make it up. That's a growth accounting story which says that total factor productivity growth was actually very strong during the 1930s. I'm running out of time, so I've got one last slide. In sum, 
you've been asleep for the last 40 minutes, probably slightly ahead of the game, but you could wake up at this point and glance at this slide. I have claimed, in effect, economic history can make you think in a constructively critical way about mainstream economics for various reasons that I've tried to itemise. Secondly, a usefully different past increases the variation of the experience that you can analyse. It can offer insights. Economic history can improve your skills by giving you some sense of those, I call them historical skills, but they're not just historian skills, which can complement your economics. And for me at least, I think some of these episodes are quite exciting. You know, I would be worse off if I'd never studied the 1930s. Uh, it would be a duller place. Oh, what I can say at the end is, sadly, I'm not sure that everybody who teaches economic history to university students quite delivers on this prospectus. But we can hope. It will get better. A student satisfaction survey say, I want this exciting, useful sort of economic history. Thank you. We're going to have like 10-15 minutes of questions now, so I don't know if you want to take a seat or... Um, probably easier if I stand up. Okay, so does anyone have any questions? Um, if you could go back to the slide where it was the depression myths. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, you know, start your question and I'll get, oh, yeah, so, get there in a minute. Um, yeah, that one. Yeah. yeah so, I guess, like, what would be your, like, one sentence response to the first two? Like, if the Wall Street crash didn't cause the American Great Depression, like, because these are the two that I, you're, you're saying they're not true, but I've been told that they are, so I just wanted to know what your rebuttal to that would have been, these two. Okay, well... On the New Deal one, I, thought, I think I dealt with that really in the talk, didn't I? So I think what I'm saying about the New Deal is the degree of fiscal stimulus was quite small. There is a fiscal stimulus, but I think we're looking at, as I say, something of the order of 2% of GDP. The American government never runs a really big deficit uh, during this period. The, what's more doubtful, difficult, is what the size of the multiplier might have been. That is controversial. The estimates that people come up with seem to be very sensitive to the method that they use. So we do see estimates which have fiscal multipliers as low as about 0.6 and other ones which are up at about 1.8 or something like that. But in a sense, I think what the literature says, and this is pretty unanimous in the literature, is it might have worked, it wasn't really tried. And if you want the most recent statement I can think of of that, Price Fishback's uh, chapter in the book I edited on policy lessons from the Great Depression uh, would, would fill in the detail and give you the earlier references. The Wall Street crash, um, I probably slightly over -egged the pudding, but I think people haven't yet been able to provide the answer. I think some of the things we probably think we do know, uh, I think it's reasonable to suggest that stock prices were too high in 1929. Um, we can argue about technically whether there was a bubble or not, but stock prices were pretty ambitious. I think that has been agreed. And work by people like Brad DeLong does see symptoms of irrational exuberance. So I think one could certainly say there is scope for some kind of puncturing of the bubble or ending of the exuberance that that will cause stock prices to fall. Nevertheless, the vast majority of the stock price falls over the next three to four years, I would have thought, are seriously endogenous. They're not an exogenous shock. They're reflecting the fact that earnings are declining very rapidly. The fundamentals of what uh, uh, informs a share price are worsening uh, very quickly. If you're going to say the Wall Street crash caused the Great Depression or offered a big shock, then you've got two more hurdles to meet. One is to say, was this something which couldn't have been countered by adequate policy response, which was Friedman and Schwartz's position? Answer, yes, it surely could, as happened after October 1987, which was a bigger crash. But I think more important, you might want to say, what's the transmission mechanism? What was it that the Wall Street crash affected? 
don't think you can say that it really seriously affected bank balance sheets, so it's not really responsible for the banking crisis. I think that's been known for a long time. I think you could also say any impact it had on consumption, any measurable impact, must have been pretty small. It's not a very big change in the wealth of the private sector overall. With any kind of reasonable propensity to consume out of wealth, you're not going to get a big effect. Peter Temin showed that uh, some years ago. I think then that leaves channels which just might be there, but they're not documented in the literature. That's why I said I think I overegged the pudding. If you were to investigate this in a modern way, I think you might want to say, did the Wall Street crash create a lot of uncertainty? Could we find an uncertainty argument undermining spending, uh, undermining aggregate demand, if you like? The sort of analysis that people like Nick Bloom at Stanford have been doing in a very sophisticated way for the modern period at the moment. I think there's a really big opening for somebody to go seriously into that analysis and revisit the question in 1929-30. So I think as the story is normally told, it is a myth, but it might yet be possible to find ways in which this was more important than it looks, according to the literature at the moment. So you're making a difference between causing and just being like the, the uh, what's the saying? The, well, the, the, the needle that broke the camel's back, but it's just the last thing in a, in a series of things that could happen. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally think if you're looking for a financial argument about the Great Depression, it's the collapse of the financial system in the form of banks which really matters. And I don't think the, the Wall Street crash is really particularly important for that. Yeah, um, two people almost in line. The, the guy behind you and then yourself. Yep. You in the very nice T-shirt, yeah. Okay, um, I just had one question. <coughs> you were saying that uh, economic history <coughs> was helping us to understand better economics now. So do you think the study of the Great Depression and other depression crises in history helps you now to uh, identify the causes of the current crisis and the solution to it? I think that would be a pretty big claim. Uh, so not as such. I think it gives you a list of suspects. It gives you some hypotheses to investigate. But it might even be that this time is different in various ways. So I'm rather against this notion that you can easily map from one period to the other. I think it's more about thinking about things. It's about thinking what the suspects are. It's offering some diagnostic hypotheses and so on. If you do do that, then it seems to me that in terms of uh, banking crises, uh, a pretty big uh, question mark has to be raised against regulation in the pre-crisis period and I think anybody who studied the Great Depression would certainly go to that as something which is quite important. I think you probably would in that context think that moral hazard is quite important in financial crises. If I'd given you a longer story, you'd also, I think, see the Great Depression as the end of a very big build-up of credit in the economy. Uh, and that is, again, I think the pre-2007 experience. So thinking of papers like the one by Moritz Schulerich and Alan Taylor uh, from 2012, which has a big data set and documents that for the period from 1870. So uh, I think it would then be incumbent to say that if you think about this very intricate literature on banking in the 1930s, it's full of the microeconomics of banking. It's full of implications of asymmetric information, uh, so on and so forth. It becomes very hard to believe in a naive efficient markets hypothesis when you've basically got various people with very different interests. They're not perfectly aligned and so on. So I think the big message that an economic historian would probably offer is constructing macro models in which there is in effect no financial sector may be fine, depends what purpose you're using it for, uh, and it may work very well in years like the Great Moderation. But in a sense you're running a risk if you believe implicitly that that's how the world is, as opposed to this is a very useful tool for various forms of economic analysis. There's an element there of horses for courses, but I do think this sort of uh, large literature on financial crises had basically been pushed aside and largely forgotten by modern macro, Kirkar 2005.
I don't think this is uh, an argument for saying we should just throw economics away. I think it's an argument for saying we need to be a bit more thoughtful about which bits of economics we bring to the party. Uh, you were next, I think. So my question is perhaps combined teaching, perhaps combined to uh, also to understanding uh, the um, development of economic ideas and approaches. Um, because I was quite pers I was persuaded, uh, I think, to quite compelling idea that teaching of uh, history of economic uh, thought should be combined with teaching of history of economics, since a lot of the, uh, if, if not all, of the approaches, uh, theoretical frameworks, were developed uh, through reflecting some of the problems of the age, and that may also teach some of the uh, different strands of uh, economic thought being more humble in their approach to reality. Yeah, I think that's a perfectly fair view, and it wasn't, of course, what I was saying here, but it's consistent with it, it's complementary to it, I think. The one thing I would say is that that's very different from the sort of history of economic thought course which was traditionally taught in the past. Uh, I think you're advocating and asking for what in a sense is a much more user-friendly kind of history of economic thought, which has a slightly different agenda from the sort of historiography of the history of economic thought. It's more about what happens when economic ideas are challenged, how do they change, why do they change. I think this does have some sympathy with uh, the kind of new course design that people like Wendy Carlin are trying to introduce, which uh, has a little element of that. Um, so I would be quite keen to see us try to do more. I think this is a very small toe in the water. At the and moment. I don't believe Wendy Carlin includes many of the ideas. No, it's a limited subset, I agree. But it is a kind of small step in that direction as to the way she thinks about how macroeconomics changed as things went wrong. Yeah, just, just to clarify a bit, I think it's just what you defined. Uh, I think as, as the, 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 I mean, how the ideas arise should be part of the teaching of what those ideas are, yeah. and not just... No, no, I understood what you said, yeah. And I, I think that's a perfectly good idea. Um, at the front and then behind you. Okay. Um, so much of the data, I guess, it's very much inferred. Or well, like a lot of the estimates, especially when you go back to Industrial Revolution, they are based on, for example, a very small data set. The estimates are, I mean, when, when you look at how you got the estimates, you can see quite a bit of a logical jump sometimes. It's not very robust. And a lot of the debate, I think it's based on one person saying, oh, I've got this estimate, and I've got this data, and another person saying, well, I've got another data, and therefore these different data come up with different stories. And in light of, you know, a lack of perhaps robust, reliable data, how strong do you think conclusions from economic history can be? You are right to say that sometimes data do not exist when we wish they do, or there aren't reliable estimates. It's quite important to know what we think is reliable and for what purpose? Because I don't think we're really talking about um, a criterion of complete purity, so to speak. We're often asking, are the data good enough to infer something which is useful? Uh, economic historians in that context often use Fogel's intellectual trick of trying to bias the calculation against the result he really wanted to see by every time making the sort of extreme opposite assumption uh, where the data were incomplete. That Fogel intellectual strategy is actually quite a useful one. If you're not worried about precision, but what you actually want is to rule out a hypothesis as being anything other than re pretty implausible. So I think it's a question of how good does the data need to be for what purpose. It's difficult to answer your question in the abstract. On the Industrial Revolution, uh, there clearly are quite a lot of gaps in the data. There are quite a lot of things where one could take a reasonably different view. It's not clear, for example, exactly what happened to real wages. Uh, it's clear what happened if you make the interval large enough, 
but within a narrower interval it's more debatable. Um, again, one shouldn't probably imagine that the rate of growth is known with any certainty either. That said, I do think we know enough, and the data have been recently reinvestigated very thoroughly, to say that what I was taught in the 60s by Phyllis Dean, the Dean and Colvie of the Industrial Revolution, is almost certainly wrong. Uh, but I wouldn't be prepared myself to rule out that the growth rate was, say, half a percent lower per year than I thought it was, or maybe even half a percent higher. You know, there, there is definitely a, a range. And so then the interesting question is, if that's the sort of reasonably sensible range to think about, does that rule out some things? Is it, have you achieved something by narrowing it down to that, rather than narrowing it down to a perfect point estimate? You had a question, I think. And, uh, yeah, so I mean, a lot of the questions here have been about how history informs the economic sign the present. Um, the, I just have a question that, about the reverse, which is how you know, economic events uh, happening now affect our view of the present. Mm -hmm. And obviously your work was hugely influential in, in kind of refuting Dean and Cole's notion that um, you know, coal had this kind of you know, caused this takeoff, which then led to the Industrial Revolution. But recently I, I read a, an article which was obviously completely biased because it was essentially saying, you know, in light of the financial crises mm -hmm. and, you know, um, the importance of the bank failure has now, you know, um, established itself in the literature, this um, uh, theorist, he argued that the Industrial Revolution was largely caused by, you know, the growth of credit, you know, the, you know, the phenomenon of national debt, especially in, in, in Britain, and I was wondering uh, what your view on that was, and the importance of credit and national debt towards um, the industrial revolution. Come back to that in a moment. Let, let me just say something slightly more general first, if I may. Um, I think you would be right to say that uh, as time moves on, different preoccupations, different concerns about the present inform the way that people think about the past. You go back and revisit it. For example, when we were last really interested in the 1930s in Britain, actually during the 1980s, the focus was of the literature then was almost entirely on unemployment. This time, we've been through a recession in which unemployment doesn't seem to be the big problem. It's something to do with productivity performance and perhaps the financial system and worries about government debt. Government debt was a massive issue in the interwar period. Uh, it is there for the present generation to go and think about again. So I think each generation does ask its own different questions about history, and that's something that keeps freshening it up you know, as something different happens. On the credit and the uh, Industrial Revolution story, I think the thing that's always impressed me is that Britain was really quite a, a wealthy country in many ways prior to the Industrial Revolution. It's had this long period of very slow economic growth, but it's way above sort of subsistence income level. It also has a very unequal distribution of income, so the implication is there is a quite large investable surplus, if you want to, uh, to, to talk about that. And then I think you've always had two hypotheses sitting there about that. One is, do people start to invest more, essentially because the world starts to look much more attractive. There are much better investment projects. So, I mean, one way in that which that works is technological progress, creates new investment opportunities, and that gets these savings put to work. Or is the problem that the savings are finding it difficult uh, to work through um, an external finance mechanism because the capital market is in various ways so primitive. I think the answer has got to be some combination of those two. The capital market does improve in various ways. But in the Industrial Revolution itself, I think one might still be quite interested in the idea that basically there is a significant amount of crowding out happening in the context of the wars with France and the fact that at that point the usury laws become an effective ceiling, a constraint, and so on. Uh, the longer term implications of the change in the market for government debt, the uh, in, uh, innovations which take place in banking and so on, is surely positive. 
the short term, not so obviously so. But uh, I think that remains uh, a, an interesting issue. Uh, I think those are the two things which must have been happening. Exactly what the balance between the two is, I don't think we have a, I don't have a clear view at this point. No, okay, well, thank you very much um, for joining us. <laughs>